Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. A reading from the, from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted, even as many were amazed at him. So marred were his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was in our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way, but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shears. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned to him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers. Though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood, but the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, many servants shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me. In your hands I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. For all my foes, I am an object of reproach, a laughing stock to my neighbors, and a dread to my friends. They who see me abroad flee from me. I am forgotten like the unremembered dead. I am like a dish that is broken. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. 
Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your kindness. Take courage and be stout-hearted, all you who hope in the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The second reading, a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was unable to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. I told you that I am, so if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Anas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. 
Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? <laughs> Jesus said, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Enos sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there, keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? I am not. Hmm. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the, of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the Praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own or have others told you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. Then you are a king? You say I am a king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is the truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Not this one, but Barabbas. No, Barabbas was a revolutionary. They, then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him, so Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? You would have no power over me 
if, I had not, if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. Take him away. Take him away. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and, carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarean, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who is it to be. In order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there, whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the Spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other, one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth. 
so that you also may come to believe. For this happens so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea secretly, a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices according to the Jewish burial custom. Now, in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was closed by the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, sisters and brothers, it is indeed a solemn day, a somber day, the most somber day on the Christian calendar, Good Friday. And the day doesn't seem ordinary. I like in Belize how most things are closed. I was up in Rancho and I think I saw one store open the entire drive there and back. You look around the church, the altar is stripped bare, no flowers, no entrance hymn. We don't even celebrate a mass today. This is really a service, it's not a mass. There is no consecration. It's the one day of the year when we don't have Eucharist. A solemn day. A day when we're called to remember the, the greatest love that this world has known. When Jesus took up his cross for us. I don't know if you ever pray the rosary, but if you do, you're familiar with the Apostles' Creed, maybe. And there's a line in the Apostles' Creed where it says, you know, Jesus died and then descended into the dead. Or sometimes it says Jesus died and descended into hell. And we have a whole theology about that that we don't talk about much, where, uh, but an ancient theology where we believe that prior to Jesus' death and resurrection, heaven was empty, nobody went. And when Jesus died, he went down into the underworld and took all of the souls who had come before him starting with Adam and Eve. There's a famous ancient Christian text where he takes Adam and Eve's hand and he kind of pulls them out of the underworld into heaven, along with all the patriarchs and, 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 and the many people who had come before him who had not yet received this moment, this world historical moment when Jesus died and then was raised to bring new life. So he descended into hell. But there's another way of understanding that descending into hell too. Um, and that's what he did when he picked up his cross. He walked into the most lonely, abandoned, dark, scary place that a human could have gone. The way of the cross. A place where he faced mockery, complete abandonment by his friends, complete abandonment uh, by his family for the most part and the people that he loved. He walked that path alone. And he could have gotten out of it. Let's face it. It would have been very easy for him to 
slip away into the crowds of Jerusalem. The place was packed that weekend for the Jewish holiday of Passover. Thousands of people crammed into the city. He could have slipped away easily. Or he could have slipped off into the, over the hills into the Judean wilderness. Romans never would have found him. He would have saved his life. But he chose to pick up that cross. As John is very adamant to tell us. He chose to pick it up. Why? Because he wanted to go to hell, if you will. He wanted to go into the darkest, most difficult place that a human being could go. And why? So that when we go into those places, we know that he's been there. When we go into those places, we know that he carries our cross with us. It was really beautiful walking the Stations of the Cross again after three years in this neighborhood and just carrying the cross with our merry, merry little band of parishioners. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, as the cross was brought into these locations, you know, the beautiful things and the challenging things that must go on in each household in our parish, you know, the joys, but on today, certainly the sufferings. Good Friday is a time to remember those. You know, the houses where there is a single mom who's got a mountain of bills to pay and every day wakes up stressed, not knowing how she's going to make it to the next day. Or the house where there's somebody dying of a terminal disease like cancer and that person is scared about my, what might come and maybe there's a son or a daughter taking care of her feeling the weight and the stress of that dark moment. Or maybe there's a place where there is alcoholism or abuse, where there's a dad who just has never learned to control his anger and still lashes out. A place where there is addiction, a place where there is mental illness, a teenager may be struggling with depression or, or despair or wondering, does anybody love me? Does anybody care about me? Maybe a family member who feels betrayed by someone that was very close to them, a sibling. <laughs> All of these dark and challenging places, these hells, if you will, Jesus descends into them on this day. He goes into the dark, challenging, difficult places to let us know that He's there with us when we walk into those places and to let us know that He will never abandon us. He's been there and back. And to let us know that in the end, His light, His love, His gentle mercy and peace gently come into all those spots and bring light and bring healing and one day bring resur resurrection. So on this Good Friday, as we look upon the cross, let's think about that great love. A love that would pour itself out completely so that we might have life. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her, to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, 
we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church spread throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy father, Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our Bishop Lawrence, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost heart and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness for all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, Increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for all our sisters and brothers who believe in Christ that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, Look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in the faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you, made, you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, 
they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they might find the truth and that we ourselves being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you, and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human family, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those in public office that our God and Lord may direct their mind and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples. Look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and the freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety till pilgrims return, health to the sick, and the salvation to the dying. Almighty ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may, might rejoice because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand. Through Christ our Lord. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship. <laughs> 
Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. invite you to come forward and venerate the cross uh, in light of the pandemic. Uh, don't kiss the cross itself, but you're welcome to make a solemn bow or touch the cross.
him whose sacred head surrounded page 94 Ah uh -huh. 
the Savior's command and formed by his divine teaching, we dare to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and the of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in all of our days, that with the help of your mercy we might be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Behold Jesus, the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. How blessed are we called to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your, of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down and pray for God's blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. Through Christ our Lord.